Um, let's go ahead and do that, and then we can go ahead with the meeting. So, okay. Um, so let me just tell you who's all here. If I've missed your name during um, the uh, call out, please tell me that you're here. We have doctors Rose, Haft, Reedman, uh, Fam, and I believe that's it from the physician category. Are there any other uh, physicians online? Okay. Um, also attending uh, from the council, we have uh, council member Jean Ransom. We have uh, Debbie Kuchka Craig, and and then the staff here at MHCC. Did I have I missed anyone from the council that's joined? And so I see uh, Bob Atlas and Dr. Wiener. Welcome, John. Hi, it's Patrick Dooley. Patrick Dooley. Patrick, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Anyone else? Okay, we'll we'll assess as others join, um, if, and we'll give them a, a welcome um, board here for the afternoon. So let's um, turn this over to, to Melanie. If you can make a few opening operational remarks, that would be great. And before you do so, I see Dr. Barr is joined. Welcome, Dr. Barr. Go ahead, Melanie. Okay, can everyone hear me? Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we just want to remind you that this meeting is being recorded. Um, please contact Anena or myself, or you can send a chat message if you're having any technical issues. Everyone should have our um, phone numbers if you want to text us. It was in an email. Um, you can unmute or mute yourself using the small button at the bottom of your screen that looks like a microphone. Please remain on mute when you're not speaking to reduce the background noise. Staff may mute you if there's a lot of background noise, but you can always unmute yourself. So you can use the chat button to send notes. It does send notes to all attendees. You can't use this technology to send a chat to a specific um, attendee on during this meeting. Uh, please announce yourself when speaking. So everyone is free to speak throughout the meeting, but since there are a lot of people, it's sometimes easier if we sequence the speakers. So um, one way we do this is we take a piece of paper, we fold it, we hold it up. You're welcome to hold up anything available to you. And then the meeting facilitator will call on people. Um, the meeting facilitator may also call on people to ensure that we have a wide range of perspectives. So at this time, I'll turn it back to David. Thank you, and good afternoon, um, Dr. Okiki uh, and Laura Russell. Um, thank you for joining us. So um, with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Reedman to, to make a few opening remarks. Okay, sure, thanks, and welcome, everybody. Um, the, the we, We're doing a little bit different uh, today than we have, and we're going to use our same uh, template, but we changed the order around. Um, because of the feedback we got from uh, Medicare that we decided that we kind of prioritize the issues. This, the numbers are still the same, but we moved the uh, top items that we feel like we, we'd like to get through, especially for the day's meeting to the top. So if you see a little bit different order, um, you'll know why. And we're going to use the same format otherwise where um, I'll introduce a topic and then um, Dr. Uh, we'll turn it over to Dr. Hans for some more comments. Um, and I'm going to do that for, to start off with in just a minute. I just want to remind everybody, too, before we get started, that because of, and we've said this before, because of our time constraint, um, we really need to get through these issues by the end of the year. Um, we need to stick, uh, stick pretty close to what the, um, the, the program is, has already been set up to do. Um, but I want everybody to understand that our hope is once we get to the initial, to the initial phase this year, that we can then double back um, and really have some more detailed conversations about some of the other um, options that have been thrown out about maybe uh, different ways to, do, to measure quality, et cetera. And I think, again, once we get through this initial stage, hopefully we'll have the opportunity to do that later. So keep all that in mind as we go through our conversation. And I'll throw it, throw it back to David and Howard to go from there. Sure. And uh, Dr. Hap, before you begin, I just want to orientate people to the table that they're viewing. Um, Dr. Hap is going to, to give us a little bit of insight to um, the what you see highlighted but um, just for your information the we added a, a table for discussion items for today being 922 and we've uh, carried it through to page five we've these aren't additional items that you've seen in the past we've just pulled them out because it will serve as an agenda item to keep us focused on items we also have um, some other attachments which uh, Alana will pull up as Dr. Hath tease them up and Dr. Reedman begin to talk about them. 
uh, so we'll get to that shortly. Um, I would welcome uh, other council members. I see Will Daniels has joined, so uh, welcome, Will. And um, I will turn this over to Dr. Hatt. Yeah, thank you, David, and um, welcome to the advisory council members. And I want to start by thanking you for two things. Um, one is for the um, the comments in, uh, in regard to the quality measures. Some, uh, we reflected and, and incorporated the comments into a transmission to um, to CMMI with recommendations for quality measures, and um, we anticipate that we'll hear very soon back from them what the uh, what their selection based on those recommendations is for 2021. Um, I also wanted to thank the um, the, uh, the advisory council members who who commented on the um, on the annual report. Um, there were uh, uh, luminous comments that were very relevant and. Uh, we incorporated those to the extent that we could in the in the text um, that's been um, now uh, sent over to the secretary for his final review, um, and we will um, anticipate getting back his uh, his final review and um, and, the, and send that out um, uh, on or before the end of the month as requested by CMMI. So um, it, it, um, as soon as as soon as finalized, we'll also share obviously with the advisory council and others. Uh, I just want to say that it looks, um, in terms of a, a annual report, it looks as good as any annual report I've ever seen. Um, I think the content is the content, but the, um, I think you'll all be pleased with the um, with the, the style and the mode of presentation, and 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 also reflect your your many very good comments. Um, and then last, I wanted to say that as as Michael has already pointed out, um, the the diff little difference tonight is we're going to be focusing on. Um, those things that uh, CMI spe CMMI specifically commented back on our last letter to them uh, that they needed more uh, specific information. Um, taking those to begin with, that I think we'll have um, less need to have deep conversations and less need with uh, for a lot of background data analysis and, uh, and interpretation, um, um, so that we can. So that we can be uh, as quickly iterative with uh, CMMI as we can be to be able to get things that are nailed down, nailed down, and move on to those things that um, need more thought and consideration. So I hope that, that we can continue to do that going forward and, and, uh, and facilitate the, uh, the process to the extent we can. Um, so other than that, just thank you for your continued participation. It's good to see that now week after week we're still um, hitting the to cover up the ball in terms of participation from uh, from the members. So thank you so much. I know it's not easy, but this is important work and I appreciate your input. And I uh, just want to welcome Dr. Berkowitz and Kathy Chapman. Uh, Dr. Reedman. Okay. Well, let's go right into the um, to the uh, the table then. And um, the first item there, which is that was number 10, now number one uh, for exclusions in the, um, the uh, FQHC, the Federally um, uh, Qualified Health Centers. Um, and uh, I'm going to turn over to Howard to have to discuss the, uh, the those highlighted areas in yellow. But there's also a uh, a little PowerPoint slide I think that we were going to present along with this. And I'll let I'll let you decide, Howard, when you want to throw that into the to the discussion. Um, but I'll I'll let you go from there. Yeah. You know, so thank you, Dave. thank you, Michael. I think if uh, Alana or Anani, if you can show the PowerPoints just to give a little background for the. Uh, for the members on the FQHC landscape in Maryland, so we'll know what the context is here. There are 17 FQHCs in Maryland. They represent 155 sites. They have 34,000 Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries, plus uh, an additional 11,000 dual eligible, so about 45,000 altogether, um, and, and about 116,000 uh, vulnerable Marylanders um, Live in health profession service shortage areas that are served by these um, uh, by the FQHCs. But as you know, by definition, they need to be in HIPSAs in order to be an FQHC. Essentially, um, next slide. So this is again a re reiteration of the kinds of you know the composite of uh, those who are uh, cared for within the health centers, and and they've been growing over the last few years. And you can just go on to the next slide. And it shows here, it shows this is the 2019 participants. This was not our 2020. <clears throat> but in the next slide, you can see what happens when we include FQHCs in our, kind of in our, our, our MDPCP family. 
So it's quite, it quite fills out the eastern shore and the western parts of Maryland considerably over what we have now. So and that's, that's enough for the slides. Why don't we go back to the presentation? So the, what, when we responded to um, the CMMI and said, in terms of exclusions, that we wanted to, um, to not exclude FQHCs because they are, number one, now included as of 2021 in the program, um, they, um, they had a bit of hesitancy and simply said, you know, we're, no, we're still not sure how they're going to make it to track two. Um, so I think the point here is that um, as the discussions that we've had with HRSA, who is the organization, the federal government, who oversees the federally qualified health care centers, the entire reason for bringing them into, into MDPCP was to move them forward um, in terms of value-based payments and population health. So this is, is a, is, was contemplated as what we would be doing with and for the FQHCs as we move forward um, anyway. Um, so it's not what I would, you know, I, I, I would be pleased to respond to them that, yes, we understand that it will change the way that they're paid, but they are willing and able in their, in their controlling organization and in, um, in, in HHS, the HRSA is also more than willing and and, and, and wants to encourage them to move forward into uh, out of their current um, fee-for-service setting, which is a prospective payment setting, to more to more value-based um, uh, setting. So, so I think the simple answer here is yes. We know that it'll be a problem in terms of transitioning them, and it's a little different payment system than fee-for-service strictly. But um, but that's still our intention. So that's. To see if there's any discussion that anyone would um, would um, have any concern about us continuing to want to include the FQHCs. And uh, Kathy, and your check for muted. Yeah, yeah I just unmuted. Um, so, assuming that they're going to be getting the extra care management fee, yes. uh, it gets significant reimbursement from federal and state as FQHCs. Is that going to be on top of that money? Or will that be reduced in some way um, to offset the additional funds? Because these are services, as far as care management, um, that they already provide. So is there going to be a, a change in the reimbursement from federal money and state money? So, so the, the, for the, the short answer is that um, by statute, they cannot get paid less than prospective payment. So they would have some additional payments um, on top of care management fees, on top of their prospective payments. So these would be care management fees would be non-visit based payments. They would be attributed to the fee for service beneficiaries, um, and they would not they would not um, they would be doing for things specifically different than what they're already um, covered in the in prospective payments. So we did a crosswalk with HRSA and CMMI and CMS on what is included in PPS and what is included in the, in the work to be, to be covered with uh, care management fees. And, and they, there are distinctions, significant distinctions between the work that's expected with the PPS and, and care management fees. The, the net result is that, but the short answer is that yes, the intention, they would, they would wind up with a larger amount of income than they're currently getting now. Okay, and um, Dr. Pham, uh, also before you begin, just note that your camera seems a bit high, so it's hard to see uh, when you're holding something. So um, thank you, and please proceed. And you're muted at this stage. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Welcome. Um, I had two questions. One was, was the expectation that they would be at performance risk for anything that they're getting above prospective payments? Yes. Um, and the other is 17 organizations, 45,000 bennies. Does that work out on average to, what, what, how does that average per organization count, head count compared to what we're expecting for other organizations in track two or that mm -hmm. are already in the program now? Yeah, very good question. So, so the, the a little difference in terms of how the the beneficiary they'd still be required to have 125 minimum beneficiaries per FQHC, but not per site. So, all of an FQHC's sites would be included in their beneficiary um, hurdle. Um, 
But other than that, they would have all the same requirements. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, other questions or comments for Dr. Haft on the FQHC's inclusion? Okay, I'm hearing none, Dr. Haft. Okay. Oh, oh um, pardon me, Dr. Okiki. So Dr. Haft, would they also consider um, some, some FQHC's that just, just may not be ready and stay in track too. Would that be a consideration to give them a longer uh, time to be in track too and not advance? Um, so so they'll all come in, all, all the FQHEs come in as track one this year. They'll be able to progress to track two and then um, within the three year period, the same as, as any 2021 um, practice would be. Um, staying in, in track two, um, I think we'll, we'll defer that, what happens to track two to the end of this discussion, because it's a little more complicated, and it would be the same for them probably as anybody, but we'll, we, I think that's our more complicated last thing to talk about. Okay. Okay. Dr. Half. Okay. okay. Oh, Dr. Reedman. Well, so in the, if there's nothing else under the um, uh, FQH season, let's talk about the next item, which is the CTO participation. And we've had some conversations about um, the CTOs, whether they uh, would continue to be um, external CTOs, whether um, the participation with them would be um, brought into the uh, actual practices. So that's really the um, discussion here. I'll turn it back to Howard then to, to, to go through um, the comments, uh, and then we'll open up the conversation. Um, sure. So so I think the specific question that CMMI posed to us when we said that we wanted to continue the CTOs was whether, whether the um, CTO, whether the business associations that practices currently have with the CTOs would need to continue in track three under the CTOs or whether they could be just independent business associations that each practice would establish with whoever they chose to establish a relationship with. And, and um, so I, I think the discussion here is is that at least from from the programs map, from the PMOs perspective, we think there's real value in the CTOs. They certainly are um, proved to be um, popular among the uh, practices, with um, more than 75% of the practices choosing to work with CTOs. Um, we know that you know particularly many of the or most of the, the small and medium-sized practices have chosen to work with CTOs, and they've provided specific resources and. And, in, and to the specific question of whether that can be done as a just as a random as affiliation that small and medium-sized practices can choose to work with, with a CTO or, or anyone to provide resources, I think that's that's a it, it's an important question and one that that I think I personally in the PMO leans toward the fact that we think that we've actually developed a, a kind of um, an association between the care transformation organizations. It's a um, some so where they're not regulated. There is some regular meetings, some controls, some oversight into um, the packages of um, services that are provided to the to the practices um, that that allows the you know to be a more organized than a disorganized um, approach to um, to providing those services. Certainly the. The practice practices currently and would continue to have the option of either working with a CTO or not, and working with any CTO that they chose to work with, depending on their preference. We don't see that as um, that system is going away. In fact, we we feel that it's a system that um, has has actually developed some intrinsic value of itself, or and and um, it should be should be maintained. So we, you know, our position is that uh, we would like to continue the CTOs. And um, and continue it in the in essentially the same format where the state does um, some matching and creates uh, helps uh, CTOs um, demonstrate to practices what the package of services they have and that the state has some continues to have oversight over that and and continues to keep, to pull together the CTOs into a into an overall structure of organization. So that that's that that would be our response, Dr. Pham. So, Dr. Haft, I, I, I really respect the, um, the community that you've created with the CTOs, and I have no trouble believing that there is real value in that. Um, just on balance, though, I, I would like some reassurance that the practices are being, you know, 
reminded forcefully that it, it really is their option because their risk is ramping up, their financial exposure is ramping up. They're going to need to start making different long-term decisions about investments. And they may, they, they may well feel the need to um, invest more heavily in things, in tools and services they have not used to date, some of which may be available through the CTO, some of which may not. Um, and and I, I worry about the peer pressure of sticking with an arrangement that they're familiar with, keeping them from you know be, being taking a laying a cold eye on what their options really are. I, I've always been amazed, to tell you the truth, having been the engineer of many of these um, of pay, uh, many of these payment models, where I know exactly how thin the margins are. I've always been amazed at how many vendors there are out there. Right. offering that tools and services. I don't know where they think providers in VBC arrangements have the resources to make so many investments, but it, it makes me very, very sensitive to how um, precise and strategic they have to be, especially when they're at risk. Yeah, I, I think that's an, absolutely an excellent point. And it's something that as, you know, as we contemplated CTOs, that was one of the, um, the fact that these are very thin margins was one of the things that we worried about whether there would be any any participating CTOs, and you know, to our surprise, there there have been many. Um, and and but I think your 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 primary point of the fact that the practices need to be reminded um, that they um, they can, um, and and perhaps they many of them will at some point no longer need those services, um, um, and and they can develop them on their own, and 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 perhaps get better better personal margins out of that. So I think that's. That's going to be a constant reminder um, for the practices, and it, it is driven. It's always been driven by the from the beginning a decision that the practices make. They can either choose or not choose to um, uh, to have a CTO. But then the only comment I'd make would be to internalize the CTOs um, is a is a huge um, uh, commitment for the practices from both a time commitment, work uh, commitment. And um, also from financial commitment, and the, the money is technically there available, um, hopefully with the care management fees, et cetera. Um, but it is a lot for, especially a smaller practice, even me medium size, and even for our group, a larger group, to take on all those responsibilities. So I think this will kind of flow into our conversation about track three and if it's mandatory, and more importantly, when it's mandatory and how those risks work. Um, but uh, I think that the CTO having the external CTOs and that option right now is going to be really important, especially as the practices gear up for um, doing this on their own. Um, but there is a significant financial and time commitment to, to set all that up. So um, I just thought I'd invite Bob Atlas to see if he has any remarks before we um, see if there are other comments and move on. Yeah. Um, did you not see the piece of paper up there? It's on. No, you, I was, your camera was off. I apologize. Uh, hmm. Okay, well, um, yeah, I do have comments. Thank you. Um, I do think we want to keep the CTOs. Uh, they have, I think, demonstrated that they can deliver some value. I think as uh, practices, you know, I, I kind of agree with uh, the comments that have been made before, but um, uh, as, as practices move up the risk uh, ramp, uh, having help with that is perhaps even more important. Um, I, I also have to note that, you know, the HSCRC has a vision of um, requiring uh, um, hospitals that have physicians in MDPCP to um, uh, to take some risk through the through the other side through the care transformation initiatives uh, side of the model. And so uh, I think there's synergies there. And um, I think we should make a strong case to CMS that CTOs be preserved. You know, if you, if you want to um, <clears throat> suggest that a CTO has to, you know, meet some sort of performance criteria to be, to be continued year over year or what have you um, to demonstrate that you know, that you're interested in effectiveness, that would be fine. That's a good point. Um, thank you. And just to note, for in case others are challenged, uh, check your camera, please, to make sure that it's on when you're when you wish to ask questions, because um, 
we may not be seeing you and we'll skip over you over you um with that um Gene, did you have a comment? I can't tell for sure if you would like yeah, to Yeah, I just, I um, actually, I agree with what Dr. Pham said about um, making sure that doctors really should make sure they understand what they're doing with regards to the CTOs. But I do think that uh, at least the physicians that we've been dealing with have been making uh, good decisions with regards to whether or not it's a good investment or whether they need to be in it. Uh, we had uh, a couple practices in the first year that were with us and after doing it with us for a year, felt very, very comfortable. In fact, Dr. Widener, who's on the call, did the mega CTO the first year, and then he was able to go to track two and do it directly himself. And that's a perfect example. But we've got a couple practices that told us if we weren't helping them, they wouldn't do the program. So I do think there is value uh, in having um, uh, the CTOs in place. Uh, and I also think, though, her point is a very good one, that we do need to make sure that doctors understand what investment they're getting from the CTO, and they should ask those tough questions of the CTO. So. Um, I, I also, uh, I really do think we do need to retain them. I think a lot of the doctors that go into track three might not want the CTOs, but I think there are going to be some who will never get there without them. Okay. Um, are there other comments to be made on this point? Anyone before we move on? Okay. I'm, I'm not seeing any. Uh, Great. Dr. Friedman. Okay. Um, Alana, you want to scroll up a little bit there? Um, actually, this one should be pretty straightforward. Um, the uh, the general options really the question was whether we agree with um, what the primary care first program suggests and that's that um, practice to have the capabilities to deliver five of the, of the advanced primary care functions and the access to um, continuity the care management um, the comprehensiveness and um, coordination uh, patient caregiver uh, giver uh, engagement and the plan care for population health and um, I think we've had this conversation there was didn't seem to be much disagreement with it and so. I'll open up the floor for any comments or any suggestions. Um, if not, then we'll move over on to the next item. Uh, Bob, Bob? Yeah, thank you. Um, and I guess I'm, I guess Bob Berenson's not here, so I'm the only Bob this week. All right, good. Um, the um, so yeah, sure, it sounds good. What's what could be wrong? I guess the only thing I'd be uh, you know, because we have the Maryland model, um, you know, so when I see like the number five here, planned care for population health, you know, we've got some concrete population health objectives that are associated with the model and other things. So I, I wouldn't want us to just, you know, throw some of the parameters to the winds uh, if they are uh, uh, instructive for physicians in terms of supporting the goals of the uh, the greater model. Dr. Hatt? Yeah, so Bob, th thank you. I think that's a that's a good point. And then, and then further on in the discussion here, the CMMI, what they asked specifically for here was more detail. Um, and the detail would include things like, as you're, as you're saying, things that would align with population health. Um, the, for us, it would be um, different than in some ways than primary care first because it would require of the use of CRISP as, a, as an essential element in, the, in, in what we do, um, perhaps the use of some of the other tools. And, and I think we will provide them with kind of the detail of basically the differences between where, um, where primary care first is general and where Maryland is very specific to the um, SIHIS goals and to the, um, and to the current structure in terms of use of our own internal tools and, and uh, and resources, so I think that's that's a you know it's a, it's a it's a good point, and that's I think that's what they're looking for is the more detail of how how would we be different in terms of requirements than than what primary care first might these general these general requirements. Uh, Doctor uh, the one comment I have for um, this general option section is around. Uh, capabilities to deliver on the five uh, primary care functions. I would say that um, IT has become a very, you know, important capability that the practices need to have. And I'm just wondering if there can be uh, some more consideration as to what that means by, you know, provider group, because it's, it, it varies. And I think that a lot of practices are struggling 
with EMRs and and we are dependent on EMRs to capture, monitor, and eventually uh, pull data to submit to um, assess performance. So I'm just curious as to if we say agree in general, is there more that will be required of the practices going forward um, as a track three and what can we do it even currently to really support them because they're at the vendor's mercy and we kind of don't talk about it and keep having walk arounds. Just curious, any thoughts around that? Yeah, I, I think what what CMMI is specifically looking for here again is the care transformation requirements and the you know basically the like the list of things that we the practices now need to do to move from track one to track two. You shall meet all of the care transformation organization care transformation um, requirements in track one plus be able to meet additional requirements that would appear in track two. It would be the same sort of listing. And, and, and further down, if we scroll down, I think there's some um, language about, um, or scroll up as it were, uh, about el eligibility and then, and then more specifically the care transformation requirements. Okay, um, any other comments here? I think it's, and we had this conversation um, a couple of meetings ago, I think, about the e EHRs, and I think it is an important point, and it goes back to, in my mind, decreasing the administrative burden and the reporting. Um, you know, the reporting of this, um, all these measures, um, is a, a huge burden to the practices and, and a huge burden on the providers. And, and unfortunately, a lot of the EHRs, even though they're certified, still don't allow you to pull that data very easily. Um, and there's a significant penalty to your practice if you're not pulling that data. Um, and there's, I think there must be, you know, if there's 500 practices in the state, there must be 400 uh, different EHRs that people are using. And again, they may be certified, but I and I don't know if there's a way, you know, Chris helps with all that, but I do think it goes back if we can minimize the reporting and minimize the administrative burden, it helps along the lines of the EHR variability, because it's significant. Um, so we shouldn't lose track of that. And um, thank you. Uh, I think Debbie, did, Debbie, did you have a, a comment or here? Or are you good? Okay. Um, and Gene's certainly agreeing with everyone. So um, Dr. Reedman. Okay. Um, so uh, Alana, you want to um, scroll down to eligibility. Um, so the, um, I, Howard, is your is that slide that little PowerPoint slide was that for this one with the number of providers? Did you want to pull that one up, or you want to? I think we can save that till a little later. So. Okay, all right. Um, so eligibility. Um, I'm I'm just going to turn this over to Howard to discuss. We we've, we've had the conversation about the um, the the current program and the recommendations. So I'm going to turn it over to Howard to discuss the uh, um, the comments there. Yeah, I think CMMI wanted to know, again, more specificity. And I think that the specificity here is um, that we would, uh, the only thing that we would be doing different from um, from perhaps the primary care first is is um, is adding, um, if, if, the, if there's a reason to do so, um, our OBGYNs, we do have some OBGYNs in the program who, who do primary care um, and our um, and some of our preventive medicine providers, we have some of those who do primary care also. Um, that would be the more detailed piece. Other than that, it's still 125 beneficiaries um, doing primary care services. Um, in the case of multi-specialty practice, 70% of the practice eligible care practitioners um, combined revenue come from primary care services. All of those would still match up. Um, we have just very few different detailed exceptions. And, and there are things that are already included in, in here. The, the notion is that we wouldn't want to necessarily exclude people who have been successful in the program over the last several years uh, by excluding them in 2023 because they're not in, a, uh, in one of the PCF categories. Okay. Uh, comments from anyone? 120, Gene asked a question about 125. It's in the primary care first also, yes. Uh, Melanie? Uh, so I just wanted to point out, Dr. Wiener had asked um, a couple meetings ago how many other providers were um, from different categories. <laughs> 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 Mom, way to get our attention. Um, 
Yeah, so, so now I've completely forgotten. So anyway, Dr. Weider asked a couple of meetings ago, like how many of those other providers did we have pediatricians and OBGYNs? And I just wanted to point out that that is in Howard's slide deck that he has on that, that outlines the uh, current participation. That's it. That's all I wanted to do. And, and Bob, I love that. Um, I love your way to signal that you'd like to speak. Yes. Yeah, so so I, I want to know where the car is going to that license plate. <laughs> so uh, Bob and Debbie. Bob, please. Okay, yeah, I happen to have a license plate on my desk at the moment. It, it involves the transfer of a car's license plate and stickers and so forth. Anyway, <clears throat> I'm sorry about the disruption, um, but apparently David couldn't see my white flag before. <laughs> so um, it's a very simple clarification question. I'm just, this, this thing that says it's 125 beneficiaries at a particular location, and when you're talking about FQHCs, it sounded like you were saying 125 in total. So I'm confused, that's all. Dr. Hatt. Yeah, so that would be, the FQHCs would not, would be a, an exception to that. There, there would be the 125 beneficiaries per federally qualified healthcare center, um, not, not per site. Uh, the others, it would be per bricks and mortar site. Okay, thank you. I think you're muted. So we're we're not able to hear you at this point. So we can we can work with you. Um, my team will work with you or you can use the chat to try to send a message and we'll work to resolve your technical challenges. Um, three. Um, We'll we'll figure it. We'll try to figure it out. Um, uh, any other comments, um, Dr. Barr? I saw you quickly. Any anything pressing? Anything you'd like to mention? No, no. I had a similar question to, to to Bob Atlas in terms of the FQHC difference, and so I think just to confirm that was good. Okay. Um, and any uh, and Dr. Pham, are you any questions or comments here? Okay, very good. Um, I think we're we're good to move on at this point, and we'll work um, with uh, Debbie to try to resolve it where we can. I think the next item is the um, actually the um, go back back up a little bit, Alana. Did we miss? Um, had it, no, this I guess it's still under eligibility. Howard, did you want to go through those comments? Yeah, so this is now more. De this is more detail in the um, in the both the eligibility and the um, and the care delivery requirements. So um, so maybe so maybe this would be a good time to to just go over what the current composition of the practices are. So we see where what practices are in track one and what are in track two. So Lana will bring up the slides. Yeah. Good. So. So here, here we have as of 2020 quarter three, there's 475 total practices and 24 um, participating CTOs. Um, out of that track one practices are 353, which is you know, three quarters and, uh, and track two is 122. Um, there are 365 practices that are affiliated with CTOs and, and 110 that are not. Next slide. Um, this is just the number of uh, beneficiaries in all practices and the CTOs and those with hospital-based CTOs, number of beneficiaries, and the number of dual eligibles that we have in the, in the program. So just as it kind of give you a, a general view of that, there, there, there's a little a fuzzy number about how many total fee-for-service beneficiaries, non-institutionalized fee-for-service beneficiaries there are um, in the state. Um, and that may be around 900,000. There may be, there's another number, and, I, and this is a fuzzy number, of those who would be in eligible practices, that is practices that have more than 125 um, fee-for-service beneficiaries. And there's about 780 or 800 of those practices. So, um, so maybe there's another 200,000 or so that are in those um, and then there's some that, we, that are not characterized. But this is what we know. The other parts that we don't know, we still simply don't, don't have good characterization at this point. One of the things that we will hope to do um, 
One of the things we'll hope to do over the next several weeks and months is provide more specific um, information about the numbers of bennies and, and more detail on, on, um, on things that will be important for your deliberations. Just got a, just got a note here that there are 750,000 um, total beneficiaries, uh, fee-for-service beneficiaries in the state, not 900,000. So um, we'll go on to the next slide. So and this is looking at um, the um, 1,879 providers that we have in the program as of March of this year. Um, and the overwhelming number of those are, as you can see, are physicians, but we also have physicians assistants and, um, and others um, in, the, in the program, nurse practitioners and others. Um, and in the next slide, um, you can see how that breaks down by, um, by, by specialty with internal medicine, family medicine being the vast majority, geriatric, general practice, nurse practitioner, physician assistant, which is not a practice, it's a characterization. OBGYNs, there are six. Psychiatrists, there are four. Um, pediatric medicine, there are six. And um, not applicable, 10. I think a few of those might be um, in our category of uh, preventive medicine. So, but overwhelmingly, it's family medicine and internal medicine. Okay, next slide. Um, and here, here is the breakdown. And this is relevant um, that 76% um, or almost 77% of the practices have five or fewer providers. Um, and then there's a, another significant percentage that have um, six to 10 providers, which are probably you know, medium size. And the most is very small numbers that are large that we have in the state that have larger, um, larger numbers uh, of providers, larger groups per se. So we characterize our state as having a lot of very small practices, a lot of small few medium sized and very few large organized practices. Now, some of those practices that are small and medium sized are in larger organizations also. They're, some of them are owned or affiliated with, some of them are owned by um, larger organizations like hospital systems. Some are also affiliated uh, with hospital systems. We don't, we don't have a breakdown between owned and affiliated now, but we'll be able to provide that uh, very soon. That's, we have to go through uh, one at a time um, to get that breakdown. Next slide. That might be the last slide, actually. Okay. I um, believe it is the last slide. Um, any oh. questions, Dr. Haft, on the slides? Okay. Um, Dr. Barr, yeah. Dr. Kiki. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Mike. Did you want to? No, say no, that? I was going to say I saw a couple of white papers go up, so. Okay. Finding that uh, unmute button that keeps going back and forth is hard to find. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, two really quick, easy questions, I think. I was just curious why we break down, we break on the beneficiaries by hospital uh, affiliated CTO and non hospital affiliated CTO. Is there a difference in the services they're offering? It was just a characterization we had. I wasn't sure well, why we did that. And I had a second question, but let me stop there first. So, so the hospital affiliated CTO beneficiaries is, is relevant to um, the, you know, things that happen on the, uh, what's called the Medicare performance adjustment, which is really on the hospital side, but it's, you know, it's, it's important information, but not, not relevant to the payments of the practices or the CTOs, but um, it's relevant because we're part of a larger system um, and it, it has relevance to that, but not, not, not germane to this discussion. Yeah, it just it just struck me as interesting that so many of the CTO the beneficiaries covered are going to practices that have a, if I understood that correctly, a hospital oriented CTO supporting them. So that was just, I wouldn't have thought that, but, but it's, you know, it probably doesn't matter. Any impact is just curious. curious. Well, yeah. And 14 of the 21, or two thirds of the, of the CTOs are hospital based. So it's, okay. I mean, and that's so the other question was pretty simple. I mean, the practice size. It's opposed to when we're talking about FQHCs and when we're talking about practice sites, the practice size is the legal unit. It's not like a multi-site practice has a, practice, a site of five and a site of four and a site of five, and there's actually 14 physicians or clinicians in the practice, but each site is five, four, and five. So I just want to make sure it's apples to apples. The practice sizes are the legal entity, but in FQHCs you're looking at the sites. 
Yeah, FQH, so FQH looks at kind of the umbrella and FQHC might have multiple sites, right. but they all get aggregated together. For the, for the other practices here, it's a bricks and mortar site per se. So how many people are at this particular location, providers at this particular location? Okay, so, so a, a practice might have multiple sites and in that number you're counting the less than five clinicians at a site that site might be part of a practice that are five sites, so there are 25 clinicians for the practice, but we're counting sites. That's correct. Okay. So I think, uh, I think our group is actually one of the, we have um, eight sites, and um, I think one or two of our sites has that lesser number of providers, but I think we're counted as like eight sites, not one, if, if my understanding is correct. I know that's how we our um, payments come in, so I'm assuming it's the same thing. Is that correct, yeah. Howard? Yeah, I think that's correct. So we, we have uh, questions from Dr. Okiki, Ben Steph, Ben, our executive director, and then um, Debbie. And I don't know if Debbie's muting the problem. Uh, can't hear you, so please use the chat. We'll keep working. Dr. Okiki. So Dr. Barr asked the question I have, but uh, to take it a step further, I was also curious as to if we're looking at this as a part of total cost of care, would we at some point be able to assess uh, performance uh, in reducing cost uh, when you have practices supported by hospital-based CTOs versus not, and what advice uh, can be offered to uh, you know us as a council or to uh, any, anyone who is a key stakeholder as to things that we should keep in mind uh, going forward. So I was just curious about that. So I would I would say that you know they they clearly. Um, the total cost of care is an issue and, and, and one that's prominent uh, because we're in a total cost of care contract. Um, the amount of um, contribution to the total cost of care that primary care makes um, de novo just from primary care is relatively small, it's four or five percent. The influence is broader than the four or five percent, but it's not infinite influence. And I think that um, your discussion will be something we'll probably be deeply in, in the, as we move forward um, in these discussions to see um, as, 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 as an element of total cost of care will be um, a mandatory element in the performance adjustments. It is in, it is in um, primary care first and, and we've got strong signals uh, from, from and CMMI that that's a that, that is um, immutable, um, and also I think from our uh, from the state in general that we need to pay attention, clear attention uh, to total cost of care. If the state is going to be successful in preserving the um, the contract and and, and um, memorializing it into the future, um, so it will be it is, it is an important discussion. How that sorts out between hospital and non hospital. Um, is, is going to be a, probably a separate uh, issue um, with a contribution both from the HSCRC and from, and from this, this uh, primary care portion of the program. Um, but it will be an important discussion. Um, and whether it's, whether it's a, a, a large major portion of the performance adjustments that go into that or whether it's a, um, a smaller portion, I think will, will come out as we look at the, some more data. Um, so Ben had a question, and then um, Melanie, we'll go to you. So uh, Howard, I think one thing that in terms of kind of uh, characterizing CTO engagement of the practices that have CTOs, what percentage uh, are in with the heavy, heavier uh, package and, and the lighter package? Do you have that number in front of you? At one time I knew that, but I lost track of it. Yeah, the 30 and 50 percent. Um, exactly. I, I don't, so I'll, I'll ask, I think um, I have some staff who are on the line here. We'll get them to, to put in a chat here in a moment. We'll get that for you shortly. Yeah, I mean, I think that kind of to, to Dr. Farm's question uh, does characterize the level of engagement with the, with the CTO, whether they're in with the 50 percent mix sharing or 30 percent service sharing. And yeah. that could be something that could actually be uh, transitioned over the the uh, track three program. There's uh, opportunities to diminish that. Uh, I guess there is already uh, under the year to year agreement. 
Yeah, and I, and so they're all year to year agreements. And Ben, that's a great point. So certainly it would not be the same, thirty and fifty percent, because the, um, the as the practice has moved to track three, they're moving to seventy five percent of their revenue more or less is going to be population based payments, and they wouldn't want to give up. 30 or 50 percent of that 75 percent so it'll be a smaller a significantly smaller number um you know now that's there's 30 or 50 percent of care management fees which are maybe 10 percent of that revenue rather than 75 percent so it, it will it will have to be adjusted agree okay melanie and melanie yep. can you also summarize uh, kathy's I mean, a Debbie's comments. That's actually what I, that's exactly what I was going to um, do. So uh, Debbie had, um, had, uh, had uh, sent her first um, chat that her question was related to pal palliative and hospice. Then are we going to include those providers? So that's the first question, Howard. So they, they're not included in the eligibility. They're, they're they're not. I don't I don't believe that they are included in primary care first. If, no, they are palliative care and hospice. Well, there. Yeah, then I I would see yes. If they are, then well, I would have no reason to not include them. Okay, and then her her second comment um, is uh, we talked about the administrative expense burden due to the program being based around the physical location sites. And she wanted to see if there is any opportunity to bring practices together, similar to what you're doing in the FQHCs under the same that are in the sites that are under the same ownership. For example, like Reedman's practice. So I think that that would be a great point for discussion. And I, and I, I you know, that the it's always been the um, the um, CP, CPC, CPC plus, and now primary care first. Um, um, modality to to define it as bricks and mortar sites. Um, I, I think there's some there is some um, you know alternative ways to look at that, um, and certainly the um, you know there might be some more power in, in greater numbers, uh, particularly you know for organizations like uh, like Dr. Reedman's where um, we've dissected out an, a, a large organization that's virtually all primary care into multiple small points. Um, I, I think it's that would be a great that would be a great um, suggestion, and I'm happy to if it's the um, interest of the uh, of the um, advisory council, we can add that as, uh, as something we would look forward to to seeing some uh, aggregation possibilities. And then her third, she had a she had another message. Is that okay, David? If I yeah. read the word, so. Um, she said to she, she just wanted to urge uh, caution when labeling CTOs as hospital versus other. Many CTOs support many practices with tremendous variability in the practices they support, and there's a big difference between inner city hospital-based practices versus ambulatory community-based practices. Yeah, I think that's a great point. In fact, there are some hospital CTOs that, that are hospital-owned CTOs. Um, that only support independent practices. So, the, so there's a there's a, a tremendous range, and also range in terms of as as she pointed out, in terms of uh, um, the kinds of practices they support, the numbers of providers, and other things. So, so I think that was not a character. That was that was probably a very um, rough characterization, and one that was actually developed for, for a separate purpose. So, um, and just I'll, to get back, did you address Jean's question about lowering the 125 number? Did you answer that, Howard? I think they did. Oh, they did. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, we just had a lot of independent practices that were excluded. I, I think the first round we helped 10 or 15 that got excluded for being under attribution. And I think we're going to lose a couple this time we helped, and I'd like to lower it. But I don't see how you've got to be as close to primary care first. If it, I think when Howard said it was right from the rule, I think we're kind of stuck. Um, it is unfortunate because I don't really understand the magic of 125, but you know, it is what it is, you know. Uh, I also actually, I just wanted to also comment too while I'm talking. Uh, the, the hospital CTOs, a couple of them, and we helped some practices sign up for hospital CTOs. There really is good logic for why some of these private practices have aligned with the hospital CTOs. Some of the private practices actually share EMRs with hospitals. And, you know, for all the stuff that you hear about um, hospitals and physicians not working well together, if you look at this program, you'll see that there are a lot of examples of 
the hospitals and some physicians coordinating care and working very closely together, even when they're in private practice. Um, and some of these different um, private practice groups, like Potomac Physicians, which is in the Hopkins CTO, is in several other quality programs with Johns Hopkins. And, uh, you know, so it, it's not, it's more complicated than I think people realize. And a lot of times they want to throw us all in a bucket and it's not really accurate. Yeah. Anyway. And Gene, um, I'll mention that um, the eligibility count, if, when we do get to the SIP discussion, it's, um, it doesn't require a minimum count. So if we can, we can bring that up later on. I think we had uh, Dr. Barr and then uh, Bob Atlas. David, um, I'd like to, um, just in, in the interest of time, how about we have a couple more comments from those two and if someone else really has a comment, then otherwise we'll move back to our table. So I'll, I'll open it up to those two. Dr. Barr. Real, real quick, I think the interest in the CTO is because it's a unique feature of this, this project. And I would encourage um, the team to think about a report about sort of the engagement and sort of lessons learned for others. So I think that's that's why I think everybody's interested. No, that's why I'm interested in it. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Bob. Really minor comment, I think. I, on the 125, I mean, panel size minimums are always uh, a toss-up. Um, actuaries will tell you that they kind of swag it. Um, but as, as the risk goes up, uh, panel size actually needs to go up to make it work, um, at least from a purely risk management standpoint or risk spreading standpoint. Um, I just, a procedural question here. So a lot of what we're talking about are things that says we agree. Um, are there things lower down on your list where we, where CMS has a view where we might not agree? Because I might like us to talk about those. So, um, so we can come back to the structure, Bob, but just as a reminder what we were trying to do uh, for the update to CMMI for this biweekly period is to show where there's general consensus on areas and then go into what we might call the more thornier issues down further below. So, um, uh, Okay, Dr. sorry I missed that. Go ahead. Uh, Dr. Reedman, is that correct? Did you, did you have a, a different... No, that, that's, that's right on, yeah. Okay. And then, then specifically, these were these were um, issues that um, in when we last communicated with CMMI, they asked for more detail. So this was this is the more detail that they're asking for. Okay. All right. If there's no other comment on that, um, Howard, you want to, um, Melanie, I'll throw it back to you, and then I'll throw it to Howard to go back to the table. Sorry, just uh, Alice posted in a response to Ben's question about how many had the higher level of support. And she says that two thirds of practices have the 50 50 split. So one third have the 30%, which is the lower, and then two thirds have the higher level of support from the CTOs. Okay. All right, Howard, you want to go back to the um, table? Sure. So, um, the, um, and before I do that, one other comment. I just want to uh, point out that one of the, one of the key features of um, the CTOs. And, it, it, and this is largely the brainchild of, of Donna Kinzer, um, who, was the, uh, who was the executive director of HSCRC during the development of this program. She, she suggested that the, that the CTOs would serve to be a linkage between hospitals and independent practices um, that would serve to link them without having to be acquired by those hospitals. Um, and then that is, in fact, what we've seen in, um, in in a, in a large number of cases that these, and I think somebody just mentioned that, that the hospitals now have very tight communications with the, um, with those independent practices that they serve. So, so to other CTOs also, uh, but, but at least one of the functions that this has um, served for the hospital CTOs was to create those kinds of linkages that didn't really exist well before when, you know, it was either, you know, we own you or, or we don't have anything to do with you. And now they have another way to, uh, closely relate and have transitions of care. So um, the next piece that we're talking about was a question CMMR wants to know about these transitions of care or transitions in the program. That is, they specifically want to know whether practices will, how they will transition from track one to track three or from track two to track three. Um, and, and, and so the, we've created a, a bit of a framework for that um, but, the, but the background for that, um, to, for us to think about, is that practices um, will require to, to at least have one year in track two um, in order to, tra to transition to 
track three um, um, if, in the current program. Um, it, obviously, if there's a point where there's only a track three, there, that wouldn't be necessary. Um, practices that would not that, that, that are coming in to um, that are coming in from the never being in the program before um, would have to um, show that the same way that they have experience with um, the same way that primary care first requires that they attest to they have experience with value-based payment arrangements or payments based on cost quality and utilization um, or such as shared savings programs or others in order to be able to enter unless they had at least one year of track two experience. Um, the track one um, practices will be phasing out um, over the next several years. And we'll, we have a mock-up of what that looks like. So we, we, um, we anticipate that now in, in, so I'll stop there for a second. So, so uh, uh, Dr. Hat, then, uh, then question. So okay. that's a that's a discussion Howard and I will have. Maybe we'll draw Bob uh, Allison about you know why practice, why hospitals may not be acquiring primary care practices as aggressively. It's really not something that we need to delve into here. We got about ten minutes or thirty minutes left, so keep going. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, any we anticipate that the track two this is a by, by request again from cmmi that we that we phase out track one so track one is already defined in the in the in the rfi in the rfa for this year practices that have joined so the, the start new starters in 21 will have three years so they'll have until 24 um to either go to track two or leave the program but for the rfa beginning in for practices that would start in 22, we'd shorten that um, to two years. So those practices would still be finished by um, by 2020, by 2024 also. Um, and that would be the last year that we would have um, new, we would have track one practices joining. So two more years of track one practices after this and they, and then a phase out of track one. So. Practices would either make it to track two, or 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 they um, they would not have a path to to, um, to track three. So uh, that's that's kind of the phasing out of track one. Then track two, they'd have to spend at least a year in track two, and some you know, some that they would have up to two years if they could spend in track two. But they need to spend a year in track two before they um, before they went to track three. Um, and then we'd anticipate that by <clears throat> by um, 2026 um, that we would only have um, a track three. Um, at that point, we would also extend the um, the life of the programs. So right now, it's it's scheduled to end in 2026, but we would extend it for the full term of the um, the 2029 uh, total cost of care model. Okay, um, reactions from advisory council members. Uh, Bob. So um, I think that's agreeable. I mean, uh, the obviously we've had a lot of folks say that they want to keep track one. I think having this uh, ramp, uh, ramp down of track one makes some sense. Uh, I'm just, you know, one wild card here that I don't know where it comes out, but CMMI has Mathematica launching their evaluation of the model and the the, the total cost of care model um, soon, and they're going to be looking at things in 2021 and in, 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 in well year one, year three of the model, and you know I'd be a little concerned if they're going to. If they're going to um, be looking at how MDPCP works, if they're seeing, you know, something weak in this, um, there's no way of knowing. I mean, they have not been public about their evaluation criteria even, uh, which is separately distra distressing. But um, 
it, you know, I think it's a fair compromise. Um, and I hope that, uh, I guess the one other thing is, at one point you said they have, we want practices to be able to have a full year in track two. Um, but then you said track two could disappear altogether at a certain point. So that's a little, I'd like a little clarification there. And, and what if, and you also seem to, to be prohibiting the idea of a practice jumping from track one to track three, or even though in a few years, track three will be the only option. Those seem to be a couple of rough edges. Yeah, so, so, so if, if we follow this design by 2024, there wouldn't be any more um, track ones. Um, they, they would either have progressed to track two or uh, because they, the last, you know, they have the last starters would be 21 where they have three years to progress. 22, they have two years to progress. So by 2024, beginning of 25, there's, um, they've either progressed to track two or they've left the program. So it would just wind down in, in, in that way. I think it could, it could be longer tail or or shorter tail, but that seems to be a more reasonable tail. But there's a little comfort that we get uh, in the fact that um, that we're we we're really nearing kind of the maximum number of practices that we could even, you know, wildly imagine out of the total universe of practices um, that exist in the state that might still might still be joined. You know, we, you know, each year it's a relatively smaller number from you know from 300 to 200 to about 100. Um, so, so I think you know we've, in some ways, done a good job of getting everybody in early, um, and I, I don't know that by the end of 24 that that there's going to be a, a you know if we disadvantage a few practices that waited five years, um, it might not be a might not be a you know so you know it's a it's a reasonable compromise and CMMI and I think most want to see track one go away. It was always anticipated at some point it would go away, so I I think that's reasonable and then. You know, I, I, you know, if a, you know, I think there's always an opportunity sometime later, you know, for practices to, to, to come in anew after a washout period. You know, we, I think we haven't talked about that, uh, but say now I've got experience with, you know, I'm a new practice. I've got experience with, with, um, with value-based payments, and I just want to apply um, to just track three. Uh, but there's those direct progression from track one to track three right now as we contemplate it. Part of that is because it just goes away. Yeah. So, um, Dr. Fahm, and then uh, Melanie, if you could summarize the few comments we've received after Dr. Fahm. Yeah, I, I apologize if I sound like a broken record, um, but I, I just I just feel compelled to say, I'm not sure I understand the rationale for allowing new entrants, even beyond this year. Um, you know, the, <laughs> I lost this battle several times at CMMI where people just didn't forgot forgot that there was a long game the long game here for maryland i would assume is expansion of the maryland model as a whole of which this is a part for that you need to demonstrate actual savings in the overall evaluation and they'll be you know taking into account this piece of it but letting in a long tail of practices who had reasons for not jumping in in the early years usually they're not healthy reasons, usually because they are not the early adopters. They are not gung-ho about value-based care. They are probably less capable. Allowing in this long tail to dilute whatever impact estimates Mathematica might come up with does not seem to me to be serving the long game for Maryland. Uh, CPC Classic and CPC Plus ran into this issue when they decided to expand it to all MSSP ACOs. Um, and as well as to practices that did not have to pass a readiness screen. I'm just, uh, so I, I apologize for sounding like a broken record because I'm pretty sure I've said this before, but just, this is just another opportunity, I think, to undermine you know, your, your long-term goals. So Dr. Haft and maybe then Dr. Reedman might weigh in here too. So I, I think, so there's, there's yet one more slide, um, Dr. Fahm, that I that we can show you with a little bit of very subjective modeling, but let's have the further conversation, other other let's not show that now. Let's let's have more discussion. Then I think I think we're we're thinking the same way. 
um, as you are in terms of um, in terms of the long game, and, um, and and we'll share some of the thinking there and, and get reflections on it. But let's do the other. If we can, just do other comments first. So I, I agree with I agree with Howard. Um, I think those are really good points, but that really kind of flows well into um, what I'd like to, to allow at least um, ten minutes or so at the end of this conversation to start, which is about track three and track two and all. Um, so if there's not a lot of comments about the um, about the uh, the eligibility, and I don't know if you want to go through the other two items there, Howard. I think they're pretty self-explanatory about the the um, electronic health records and about the um, requirements. I don't know if you want to go through those. Uh, Dr. Friedman, could I interrupt? There was a couple comments you might uh, the council sure. from here, Melanie. Yeah, so um, just um, Jean and uh, Debbie Kuchka Craig agreed with the progression from two to three. They thought that was a good compromise and showed a commitment to progression. Um, Jean commented that MedKai did a lot of marketing to folks who could, they thought could be in the program and they don't believe there are, to Howard's point, they don't believe there are too many practices out there who could who could be in it, meaning they will qualify that are not already in it. So I think they're, Jean, just confirming Howard's point there. Um, so uh, Dr. Wiedner says, uh, do we understand if and when how many track one practices have failed? Um, my concern is that uh, some track one practices that show cost savings may be eliminated. Dr. Hatt? Yeah, so so um, we will note, so the practices now have three years to, um, to succeed. Um, and so that we don't, none, none have failed at this point. There's, we're just now, will just be beginning the third year. So everyone's still in, all the track one practices. We will know until the beginning of the fourth year if, um, if any have um, decided not to go on to, um, to track two. So it's not failing, it's, it's they, they have to meet the care transformation requirements. Um, they need to meet certain quality and, and utilization requirements in order to go to track two. So it's a failure of successes based on you know, on their performance um, entirely. So, um, so that's that's yeah. I, and and it's hard to tell. I think more most most of the practices, if they don't go on to track two, will because they've simply, uh, I assume, are going to be at least what we've heard so far that they find the um, the movement to more value based payments and and prepayments under the CPCP to be daunting. Um, not not that they um, not that they at least that's been the hesitation for currently for practices to go to track two. It's the uh, understanding how they will fare under a different payment system, um, and that's a that's a perpetual issue that is highly understandable. The practices, um, um, you know, unless they're very confident that they're going to um, still be able to achieve their financial goals, they're going to be hesitant and want somebody else to go there first and prove to them that it's safe. Um, yeah, so Howard, I don't know if we want to go through the last two um, items there real quick about the EHR, as I mentioned, or the advanced care delivery. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Did you want to? Yeah, yeah those, are, those are straightforward. And the care transformation uh, requirements that we were, were requesting are the same, essentially, that we have in the in the current program. The only other question that they want, they, the easy one, is AAPM status. Um, um, that we would just align with um, what currently is in, um, in you know, we're now in, in, in primary care first, it's the medical home rule, which says basically, you know, if you're, uh, if you're in this, that you'll get an AAPM as long as you're not greater than 50 practices or providers in your parent organization. There is one other opportunity if, if there's sufficient risk, and the risk hurdle is 5% of total A, of total A and B, uh, revenue. If if we exceed that, we might be able to get into um, into another door um, for for through the risk door. But other than that, I think it would stay the same. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Riemann, we have about ten minutes. If you or fifth, a little closer to fifteen, but we'll need about three minutes to do the wrap up. Yeah. So, I, actually, we we Tyler just touched on the um, the advanced alternative payment models and stuff and. Um, we can certainly open that up for a brief conversation, but then what I'd like to do is um, set up our really kind of a setup for our next meeting that 
I think is one of the more controversial issues and will require more conversation is about the mandatory part or the phase in, if it is mandatory, of the track three. Um, and it goes into some of the comments we've already made by others today by Dr. Fahm and, uh, and Bob and all. So um, anything else, under, uh, if there's nothing else under the advanced, uh, I'll turn to the Howard, then I'll, I'll, I'll let you go ahead with the last slide that we had and kind of open up our conversation for people to start thinking about for our next meeting, which we're hoping to have next Tuesday, by the way. Okay. Okay, why don't we put up the next slide and let me, while you're doing that, um, I will say that the, the question that was posed here by CMMI um, had to do with, um, it had to do with, with the specifically whether um, we um, are contemplating various levels of risk for track three, similar to what um, what is currently in, in CPC plus and in MDPCP with the CPCP ramp up in, it's not in so much in risk, but in the, per, the percentage of, uh, of prepayment that's made. So in CPC plus um, and in our program currently, we allow practices to kind of get a toe in the water first at a low level of transition of payment and then have to ramp up. But the ramp up goes to different levels depending on their tolerance for ramping up. And it needs to be progressive over time, but acknowledges that different practices will have different essentially risk levels. Primary care first does not have a ramp up. It's a jump in suddenly and you're, everybody's in. There's a one year kind of different way that um, the performance is adjusted, but but it, it, it has um, a, a single version, pretty much is what I think what Dr. Pham was alluding to. Um, so what we did here with these three graphs is we took the first two years of real data in what, who's in track one, who's in track two, um, and knowing that there's no, no track three um, yet in the, in the program, um, and then said, what is it gonna look like going forward um, in terms of our total um, participants in the program and the total beneficiaries that we would cover. And I think as Dr. As, as Dr. Pam mentioned, the long game here is that we bring as many uh, fee-for-service unmanaged beneficiaries under um, a well-developed and highly managed um, group of primary care practices in a program as possible. So a lot of that is is and I, I, I akin this to we've been having. If you give me a little license for this for one minute, we're having a lot of discussions in the Department of Health now about immunizations and the immunization program going forward for COVID. And one of the one of the really smart people who runs the program in immunizations in in um, in, in in CDC, who's been around for a long time, um, made the great point that it's not vaccines that's the important thing here, it's vaccinations. Um, it's, it's how many people actually get the vaccine. And the big issue that we have is now it's vaccine hesitancy. People are not sure that they wanna get that because they're not sure what they're getting. And our big job now is to reduce vaccine hesitancy. In the same way, we have a really good program that we have here and track three can be a really good program but it's not the program that's important. It's the people and the practices that participate in the program. It's participation that's important in the end. So you have a great program that participates, it's still no good. So what we modeled here was we made some assumptions um, and in, in the um, assumptions in the bottom, in the top is an assumption, in the top left is an assumption that says, we just use primary care first as is and everybody jumps into the 10% down, 50% up risk side. Um, and we said that a per significant percentage of the practices that have already transitioned from track one to track two um, that are small and medium sized practices, which is a large number, even though some of those might be in larger groups, but it's still a large number, that that would be daunting for them. So this is very subjective, you understand. There's a RAND study um, that was just interview study that was released a year ago. Um, well, early, earlier this year, actually, AMA 
engaged Rand, and they asked a lot of questions about about risk tolerance. And one of the things that practices opined to the the leaders and the and the practitioners was that they were um, they were risk intolerant for things that took significant amounts of their revenue and put it at risk. And there were also risk intolerance that there wasn't flexibility in the risk. So they like to be able to ramp up and they like to have some some uh, understanding of, of how that's going to affect their their cash flow. So that was the things that worried them. So we this is not, again, this is not a, an objective measure. This is we subjectively said a large proportion of those small, medium sized practices. Let's take them out. And where do we wind up? And that's where you wind up with the the um, dark bar at the end. It goes back from a low, you know, from us having, you know, 300 or 500 practices nearly now to um, to something winding up in a little over 150 or so practices in a much smaller number of beneficiaries. And then if we just, if we jump to the next, um, to, to the next side, if we say, let's make it less risk, but um, you know, but moderate risk, but not so much flexibility. Um, and there, you know, brings in more practices. Um, so we don't take it 10% down and 50% up and make it 20, you know, 5% down and 25% up. Again, this is just randomly picking numbers. We said, we think that, will, you know, behavioral economics says that that will bring more people in, um, but probably not um, to the same number that we might get. If you make in the bottom, if you said, we allow this to be flexible in the same way that our current program is, which allows people to to incrementally increase their risk. Um, it also allows smaller practices that are risk less risk tolerant to say, I'll incrementally increase my risk, but I won't ever reach the same risk or reward level as, as someone who might say, I can tolerate more risk, but I can also want to get more reward. So I think those are, and this is this is going to be a much more in-depth discussion. But that's how we think about this: is that is that in the end we want to make sure we, as Dr. Pham's good point, that we want to maximize the ability to make this a long game and include a broad-based transformation. Um, and to do that, we may have may have to make this more flexible in terms of the ramp-up time and in terms of the um, risk corridors. And I think we've seen models like that. I think HSCRC has done the same thing in terms of ramping up hospital risk over time and, and making the corridors, you know, compa compatible with what uh, the tolerance of risk that they could uh, you know, reasonably accept under their, you know, their, their, um, their uh, cash flow structures and, and their reserves. So I think it's not unprecedented in Maryland. Um, and it is precedented from CPC plus, it's just not precedented in you know, primary care first now. So I, I'll leave that now up to our last few minutes of discussion. So, hey, David, um, so I'd like to put people with some white flags up, and I'd like to give them the opportunity to make some brief comments. And I'll, I'll preface it by saying that the purpose of this last slide was really to, I think this is a significant conversation. So if we can help to focus our conversation for next meeting with the, a couple of these comments, I think that'd be very helpful. And then I'd also ask if anybody has um, specific um, points on these um, but maybe they email the committee or the um, or, or Dr. Hafter, myself, or David about those. So we can kind of again set the discussion up for next meeting. So I know that Dr. Fom has. Uh, I think I saw hers up first. So I'll turn it over to her. And then then Ben, Dr. Fom. Okay, thanks, um, Dr. Reedman. So I I I of course completely support the flexibility, um, and you know you don't need these graphs to convince me. Um, because I think what we're after behaviorally is their fear of the first dollar of loss, right? Yes. The, what we want is per, to, to prevent the first dollar of loss. We care much less about the hundredth dollar of loss. I know they care about it, but all we need them to be afraid of is the first dollar of loss. Having said that, the point I was trying to make is a somewhat different point, which is that, you know, just, just to be provocative, if we could put on the table a discussion of whether the program would consider um, drop uh, forcing out those practices that do not perform. That is what I mean about curtailing your risk in the long game. You want the best performers in this program. It is actually not about the number of beneficiaries. 
math when Mathematica takes its results to OACT, OACT will look, you know, they'll, they'll look at the size of it, but you could have a model that um, only, you know, uh, serves one county in Maryland and the impact estimate will be what they care about. You need practices to actually perform in this model. If you have the opportunity, the provocative suggestion would be to force out those practices that consistently do not perform, whether or not they are in upside only or two-sided risk, and get them out of the program, out of the evaluation. Dr. Ath? Oh, no, so I, I think that's one of the things we discuss um, often with our colleagues at CMMI and, and something, it's a separate issue, but um, but we do have some visibility on practice performance and, and, and we don't have the ability within the state now to, um, um, to be able to uh, exercise any um, any actions against practices that are not performing, but that's something that I think we will we will e include for certain in the um, in the cons in the consideration. Um, so Ben, I believe you had a comment in that, and I and in, 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 Ben, you're muted. Yeah, I struggled to find that button too. Um, I mean, it's important that these are. These are conjectures uh, once the intersection between line, basically line, red line and yellow line after that point, they're hypotheticals, but they're, they're good ways to look at this, I think. But I mean, one other thing to answer Dr. Fahm, I mean, by kicking the practices out, they, they still are gonna, uh, in one way or another, impact the total cost of care. Uh, so, the MDPCP program could be actually evaluated stronger, but the overall model, uh, depending on how those rejected practices actually perform outside of the MDPCP program could be uh, negative to the overall performance in the state. I'm not, I'm not certain that they would, but they, um, but they wouldn't. The other point I would raise, and, and, and I'm trying to, trying to remember what Friedberg said, was that you know physicians are practices are hesitant of risk but they're also hesitant of complexity uh and you know we uh, i would endorse the idea of a transition i think but we also have to keep in mind that that complex programs uh and everyone seems to be making more, more complexity a critical element of these uh efforts uh is also going to deter practices. So I think we have to keep that in mind too. And transitions probably, uh, although beneficial, probably add to some complexity that we need to keep in mind. And uh, thanks, Ben. Dr. Riemann, can we close with uh, Bob Atlas's comment? Bob? Sorry, I typed it in the in the chat. That's I just wanted to say that Dr. Fahm's comments are worth further discussion when we have a little more time. Yeah, I think that's, I, I agree with Bob. I think this is a perfect uh, end to our meeting today. We I think we got through actually the agenda item we wanted to get through. We knew that this would be a more complex conversation and probably take up most of our next meeting. Um, but we want to give people a kind of a heads up and, and some things to think about this week. So um, thanks everyone for coming. We've got a, a minute or two on the meeting. We're still planning to keep uh, every every week, maybe a skip here and there if we need to. Um, but to keep moving, and uh, again, I, I appreciate everyone's time and effort uh, and look forward to our further conversations. Uh, Howard, do you or David want to end up our meeting there? Um, Dr. Um, Half, if you have a comment, then we'll just make an operational statement afterwards. Nope, no, I just want to thank everybody. Great conversations, as always, and really appreciate everybody's input. And we'll um, summarize the, the comments and report back to CMMI and let you know what happens from that. Very cool. Don, um, ben, any last minute thoughts? So just uh, again, a call out to the NACC staff, David, Melanie, Alana, Anine. Uh, great job in keeping these things rolling. And uh, David, uh, I think several people said they appreciated not being called on today. So uh, kudos to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Very good. Melanie, do we have any operation statement we need to make? 
Uh, so I just wanted to say that again, this this table serves as um, the detail of what we discussed at the meetings. So if you um, look at the website, which we point you guys to in our follow-up emails, um, after the before the next meeting, there's a high-level meeting summary, the video, and then the table from the prior meeting, and then before the next meeting, which you know we'll have next Tuesday from five to six thirty, we will be sending around the materials that we intend to use for that meeting, which will include you know the new the new version of the table and any other meetings like uh, materials. I'm sorry, like uh, today we sent the the slides. So um, that's all I have. There was a, a final comment from Bob Atlas in the um, chat, just saying that Dr. Pham um, remarks on terminating underperforming practices are worthy of a uh, deeper discussion. Very good. So uh, thank you all for a great conversation and for taking time to participate. Um, I bid you all a fair adieu and have a great evening and we'll talk next week. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you.